Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. My name is Pincha Shapiro, and I have the honor and distinct privilege and responsibility of working for the Jewish Educational Center, the flagship institution founded by Rav Pinchas Mordechai Taitz nearly 80 years ago. I would like to thank some of the generous sponsors for today's program, including Stephen and Aviva Singfer, Marjorie Blendon, Jason Kahana, Chaim and Shana Pinsker, among others. Although yesterday marked the 25th year site of Rav Pinchas Mordechai Taitz, his life and legacy continues to have an impact on Jewry worldwide. Today, we are privileged to have two distinguished leaders of American Jewry, individuals whose multi-generational roots to Rav Taitz run very deep. Rav Ephraim Goldberg, senior rabbi of the Boca Raton Synagogue, and Rav Benjamin Blau, rabbi of the Green Road Synagogue. Though the weather difference between Boca and Cleveland could not be more extreme, the light of Torah emanating from both of them shines bright and illuminates the world. Rabbi Goldberg descends from the famed Abaw family, which was one of only six Shomer Shabbos families in Elizabeth, New Jersey, when Rapinchas Mordechai Taitz arrived in America. And Rabbi Blau is a grandson of Rapinchas Mordechai Taitz. Both have been informed, inspired, and influenced by Rav Taitz, his life, lessons, and legacy. Without further ado, I give you Rabbi Goldberg and Blau. Thank you, Rafinchas, for that warm introduction. Thank you for all the work that you do on a regular basis on behalf of the Elizabeth community, particularly the JAC community. You're doing a beautiful job of continuing my grandfather's legacy every day, and we owe you a great debt of a card at all. It's really a privilege this morning to be with Rav Ephraim, who is a dear friend, and as you mentioned and alluded to in your introduction, our families go back three generations, and going back to his grandparents and my grandparents, actually, for those who know well, going back to my late grandmother, Rebbe and Bessie Tights, originally Bessie Prail, who knew the Abrofs prior to my grandfather coming onto the scene. And of course, then my grandparents together with Rev Ephraim's grandparents were so instrumental in building the community. I'd like to share with you the context and then the framework for how we're going to have our discussion this morning. I'm going to introduce different topics, different areas, where my grandfather made an incredible historic mark. And then Rev Ephraim and I are going to discuss both the legacy of my grandfather in terms of what he accomplished, but perhaps equally important, how it shaped the way we frame our rabbinate and the activities we engage in. I'll start with the most dramatic, and that was the creation of the community. It is true that there were Jews in Elizabeth prior. In fact, my grandfather succeeded his late father-in-law, my great-grandfader, Rabbi Lazar Meir Prel, Zeker Tzadik HaKadosh Lavracha. But my great-grandfather was cut down in the prime of his life. And when my grandfather, Rapinkos Mordechai Taiti, Katsadar Kadosh Levracha, married my grandmother, my Bubby, as she was fondly known, they created something new and dramatic far beyond that which had preceded them. And that was the creation of a full fledged community. And the idea that a community be created outside of New York. At that point in time, there were few tower centers, there were few major places where the religious community had thrived in the North American area. And my grandfather was determined that it was important to create communities outside and make sure that Jews, wherever they were throughout the country, could have homes where they could raise their families in Torah and Yiddishkeit. And that's what he did. And he not only did it in Elizabeth, he also did it in other places as well. And he was happy to go to any community that was willing to start and give them chizuk, personally, professionally, in any capacity that he could. And I've always been amazed by the way he built community. And I have to confess, that sometimes in your younger years, as you go through different stages, you question, he did it one way or another way. I did have the privilege of working together with him for 11 years. But as I got older, I realized the incredible wisdom of having everything unified under one roof, having all the shuls and the schools, everything being under one leadership, his leadership. And then Yabad Lachayim, continuing with my uncle, Rav Lazar Meir Taitz. Again, that model is a very unique model, but I think it was a model that really transformed and allowed him to create this community and sustain it for all these years. Rav Ephraim, your thoughts? Yes, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Rabbi Shapiro, for inviting me to be part of this. Um, on the one hand, I feel a tremendous insider to the Elizabeth community, to JEC, to the legacy of Rabbi Tights, and obviously in many ways I'm, I'm an outsider. So it really is an honor and a privilege for me and for my extended family to be able to recognize and memorialize and, and mark this significant Yeret site of a uh, truly outstanding Gadol, a person who was at the forefront of building Jewry, not only maintaining it, but building it. When many others were just trying to survive, he went into thrive mode and said that there was no time 
to simply try to uh, continue to exist, but there's no reason that we can't expand and we can't uh, train American Jewry in a vocabulary and to speak a language will make it resonate and will make it continue. Uh, Rav Bini is uh, Rabbi Blau is a dear friend for many years, and though you wouldn't know it from looking at the two of us, he is a few years older than I am, and I say that not to um, not to make him feel good that he hasn't aged or make me feel bad, but I say that only to say that when I was younger and would visit Elizabeth, and in those years you were working with your grandfather, and I listened to you without knowing it, you were a passive mentor to me early on. You were somebody I looked to and saw a young person who was excited to be going into the rabbinate and to be making a difference, and so um, for me it's been a great honor. It's blossomed into a friendship, and we work together in so many different capacities, and we compare notes and talk on a regular basis. Um, look, exactly what you're what you're describing is true. I know here in Boca Raton, where we try, and we're going to get into this this morning, where we try to follow that model of, of creating a kahila. It's not a shul in isolation. It's not just a shul on a block among uh, countless others, but we're trying to create a sense of community. And when a person reflects and says, who is the precedent? Upon what model can that be built? Who can we turn to to see where are satellite shuls with a main hub of the shul? Where is a community that operates with one set of minhagim? Where can we envision such a thing? There really is one place to turn, and that is Elizabeth. And um, what's really extraordinary is that is that your grandfather, Rabbi Taitz Atzal, was invited to many prominent positions in New York. And he had the opportunity to bring his talents, as one would say in today's vernacular, to bring his talents elsewhere, to places under a much larger spotlight, which a much bigger or pre- prestigious, at the time, audience. And yet he felt a real loyalty to his father-in-law, and he wanted to build that kihila. And he saw in Elizabeth the possibility, um, not only to not compete from a strategic point of view, but to build a kihila modeled after what he saw and lived with in Europe before he got here. And he took that extraordinary responsibility and early on, um, though it wasn't easy, and a person needed that livelihood in order to provide for their family, he built Elizabeth so courageously. I know that in uh, 1935, I understand uh, April 1935, he had a meeting of the community where he said, I have to leave Elizabeth. I have to take my family, we have to move. And people looked at him shockingly, like, what do you mean you have to move? He said, there's no mikvah. If there's no mikvah, how could I live here? They said, well, you could go to Newark, or you could go into New York to Manhattan. And he said, that's lovely, but if we're going to have a Jewish community, if we're going to have a future, we need to have a mikvah. And that night he raised the necessary funds, and they built a mikvah. And that, that story, to me, really symbolizes leadership and courage and faith and being principled, um, but all according to Shulchan Arach, who says that the mikvah is the most important institution within a community. And he was willing to, to get it done, not worried what people would think or say of him, but advancing the community and its interests. So um, I have memories as a child of, of visiting my grandparents. You mentioned the family's connection um, going back generations, uh, of which we are very, very proud. My great-grandfather, Yona Gedaya Eboff, who learned in Kishinev, became a shochet, had relatives in America, he came to Elizabeth to be the shochet under Rabbi Prail. And he was then the Shochet under Rabbi Taitz and about Kore, and, and as uh, Rabbi Shapiro said, was one of the few early homes that were Shomer Shabbos in the community, really partners. And, and my grandmother, Ruth Nolman, Ruth Aboff, uh, Allah Shalom, was uh, one of the early primer teachers. I, whenever I meet people from Elizabeth, if they're over a certain age, they say, your bubby taught me to read and write. Every Over a certain age, every person who grew up or lived in Elizabeth, your Bobby taught me to, to, to read and write. So we feel very, very connected. And, and my memories from that childhood of seeing the image of Slobodka, of seeing Rabbi Tights walk to the end of the bima, and he didn't have to say a word. If there was someone talking in the shul, he just took three steps forward, looked in that direction, and everybody sat up straight, and nobody said a further word. I have such vivid memories of seeing that the mahus, the tsura, of what it meant to be somebody who saw the godless Adam, the way he carried himself, Slabadka, and the community that he built continues to inform me. So it's really a great honor to be here with you. Thank you, Rev. Ephraim. I'm very humbled by your earlier words. I think we're equal mentors to one another, but I am older. That's not going to change. Uh, that is a reality. I just want to develop one of the ideas you were describing and really note that my, Rev. Beryl Wine had mentioned that when he was a young man learning in Chicago and there were all the visitors after the war, after the Shoah, after the Holocaust, and all the great figures would come, and they'd all lament what had been, what had been in Europe, what had been lost. And along came this rabbi and talked about what we were going to do, we were going to build. And he was so struck. Who was this individual? 
And that was, of course, my Zaydi, because my Zaydi believed that we could, as you mentioned, not just survive in America, but we could thrive. We could really build Torah communities. And Rav Wine said, as I remember him speaking, he said he used to make a lot of, as a lawyer, he was a very successful attorney. He made more, he paid more in taxes than his salary as a Rav. But he was inspired to go into the, the, the role of a, of a rabbinic leader based on the model he saw in my grandfather. And just to develop the idea a little further, even the, even the way now, like you were mentioning, I know in Boca Raton Synagogue, you have many, many minyanim under one roof, many, many different expressions. And my grandfather believed that as well. He did that by creating multiple shuls, <laughs> multiple shuls under one roof. I don't think either you or I have the ability to do that in the same capacity. But it's the same concept, the realization that my grandfather realized different parts of the community, there were different sections the community that needed his guidance. There were different sections of the community that did things a little differently. I remember in my years together with him, the the the, the nature of the of different minyanim. Every you know, Adas Shuren was different. It was was different than Beis Yitzchak, which was different than the JC, which is different than Adat Israel. Everything had a little bit uh, of a different feel. And my grandfather loved that because that was you were appealing to each section of the population. Each section of the Kehila was getting what they needed. And it was important to him. It was important even when he moved. When the, when the community shifted, he still was important that each one of these shuls were maintained because it was so critical that that first that area was maintained, but that each brand had the same. And I know when I, again, uh, tried to create multiple binyanim under one roof is really a representation of that same concept that my grandfather embodied. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that was, it was tremendously prescient. It really was a visionary. Whereas everybody else locks themselves down on, this is my Ashkafa, these are Armin Hagim, this is the way we do it, I need everyone in my main minion, right? There are still shuls, we have colleagues who will oppose the notion of a Hashkama minion or any other minyanim because they believe everything has to be centralized and focused in, in only one place. And, and I think it took a lot of vision to say that not everybody fits in the same box. Not everybody geographically is going to live in the same location. So you can expand your influence and you can expand your sense of community and you can expand those shared values and vision if you're willing to... Uh, to share with others. You're willing to create satellites. You're willing to create auxiliaries and other smaller shuls, as you say, that takes tremendous, tremendous vision because people are different and we're living in a world, especially today, of, you know, everybody's on demand. You order on demand and you watch on demand. You listen on demand. You make the playlist of what you want to listen to and you don't have to suffer like we did in our childhood when you had a record, certainly, but even afterwards with tapes. You remember? Somebody you love came out with a new tape. And there were three songs in the whole tape that you liked, but you had to suffer through all the songs on both sides of the tape to hear the three songs that you liked. Because if you would forward, you didn't know exactly when to stop. Today, you know, our children have no clue what we're talking about. You make a playlist and you only ever have to listen to what you want. So life is on demand. Everything is on demand. And in a world of on demand where people want exactly what they, what they are used to and what they demand. So he was really early out in saying that everybody should get um, you know, we have to be able to, to market to people by Sherusham where they are and to reach them in that way. Again, all coming back to the notion of building Kehila, of the community being bigger than any person, being bigger than oneself, but having a shared set of vision and values. And I know we're going to continue to talk about this, and, and I should say, and, and, and I said, but I'll keep saying, I'm grossly inadequate to be sharing these reflections. You are so much better positioned than I. But I think Rabbi Taitz's godless was he combined the traditions of the old world, whether in his dress or whether in his attitude and approach, whether his unwavering, unequivocal commitment to Torah, to Halacha, to Misora, and at the same time, his commitment to being modern, a modern Torah community. Not modern Orthodox, but a modern Torah community. A commitment, as, as you said to me the other day, of being Orthodox, and you can elaborate now, and being and being modern, and that spoke to people. That's what connected to people. I remember reading that that early on in his rabbinate, um, when it became clear that if he spoke in Yiddish, nobody would understand what he was saying, he would sit with your grandmother, and he would write out his drasha in Yiddish, and she would translate it into English, but write it with Hebrew characters, the transliteration, it appeared in Hebrew characters, the English. I don't know if the family still has those those files, but those must be extraordinary. The English drushas written in transliteration of the Hebrew characters. And that story says everything, right? Of, of a commitment to communicate the traditional Mesora of Torah, of Slobodka, of Europe, of the Gedolim that he was connected to, and to be a link in the chain he came from but to communicate it in the vocabulary, in the language, in a way that would resonate and that would inspire the Jew in the modern world. 
that is exactly true. As you mentioned, he used to say, be modern, be orthodox in so many ways. Uh, I know that so many of his early supporters, they, they saw that beautiful combination, that connection to Europe, because he, there was clearly where he was rooted. And I remember so fondly the many, many times as a child sitting at his Shabbos table, sitting at his Yantuf table, sitting with him together in the sukkah, and he was telling me the stories. And I was part. I felt part of that legacy, part of that connection, because he was my connection. He was my link to those generations. He was clearly, to all the survivors who came to the, to the community, he was a link to the past, but he thought like an American. That's what they said all along. And you're right, you put it very well, that combination with my Babi Elias Shalom, figuring out the speeches in English to the point where English became so comfortable, and you never knew that actually I think he was for always thinking in Yiddish. I always think he was really thinking in Yiddish, but he spoke in English. Although I do have to say, I need to take credit or blame. I think even the, the Shabbos HaGadol and Shabbos Shuv addresses remained in Yiddish until I was old enough to come, and then he switched them to English, because mm. it was important that everyone, including the grandchildren, understand. But there was that beautiful link. And I do want to mention, just in sensitivity, I mentioned a number of shuls earlier. Of course, there are Moral Hills Minyan, the Svartic Minyan that now exists, all these other Minyanim are really a continuation of that idea of my grandfather, Bashir meeting the people where they are, meeting their need. Just Can I ask you, Rabbi Bob, sure. before you continue, if I could ask you a question along the same theme. Sure. You know, I, I did a fair amount of research. I, I, I gave a talk in our shul because we did a series on people of the book and, and really great leaders of, of the 20th century in America. And, and I spoke to you then and, and, and members of your extended family and obviously my family. But what I didn't come across, and I'm curious to know whether you have an answer, is given where he came from and given his education, where did Rabbi Tights get all the knowledge, the ambition, that CEO mentality, right? The builders, I know the builders we think of as the group of survivors who built a real estate empire, and maybe they lent their expertise or what they learned in their partnership with him. But where did this Talmud of Slabotka, where did this Talmud of Gedolim of the past, where did this Rav steeped in Talmud Torah, where, and, and all the aspects of, of being, of Rabbanus, but where did he get the skill set, the ambition, the drive, the know-how to be able to build in the way that he did? Did he, did he read? Did he listen? Did he consult experts? How did he get that education? That's an excellent question. So I'm going to tread into uncharted waters. I'm going to give you my own take. And all my members of my family will correct me afterwards. And perhaps if I'm making them, if I'm in error. But I think part of that was innate. Part of that, really, you mentioned that the idea of Slobodka, there was a break kite. There was a breath of Slobodka. The idea of being a leader was very important. And the idea of always being creative and always thinking to do more, that was really built into his DNA from the Slobodka yeshiva. Mm. It's interesting to note, historically, how many, the, the altar of Slobodka was a dreamer, was it a similar personality. The altar of Slobodka was, in a certain sense, to use your terms, or from a CEO. He really knew how to run things so expertly. And so many yeshivas, so many of the great yeshivas in Europe were yeshivas that he created because he sent his tamidim. He sent his son to Mir. He sent all these different places. So that idea, I think, again, part of it was innate to who my grandfather was. Part of him was intellectually curious, always looking to learn and very, very interested in always knowing more. But part of it, I think, came from his roots, specifically came from Slobodka. My late great-grandfather was, I mean, the, the, the rabbinic genes, of course, go back many, many generations. That was, a, in, that was part of his DNA. But I think a lot of it was his upbringing and that sense of, Slobodka, you had a responsibility to make a difference in the world. That's where my grandfather, that was steeped very much in his tradition. And I think that mm. was part of why he was so successful. Right, well, when you think about his classmates in Slobodka, so to say, classmates, his fellow Talmidim, Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky and Rav Ruderman, who was the founder of Ner Yisrael, and Rav Hutner, of course, Chaim Berlin, Rav Yechiel Yaakov Weinberg, the Sri Eish. I mean, the fact that the yeshiva created that cohort of graduates of Talmidim who shaped, maybe not the Sri Eish, but the who's who of America in the 20th century responsible for the continuity of, of Torah life, and not only its continuity, but its proliferation. I, th I think that's a, a great point you're making. But, but as we bring that to today, and, and I know that we share this in common, and some of our colleagues do, that notion of the rabbi as a CEO is an unusual model. I think Rabbi Tights really brought it here in, in that way. And the other names I mentioned were Russia Yeshiva. They led Yeshivas. Rabbi Tights, of course, founded Yeshivas, but, but was the Rav of a Kahila, of a community, of a, of a Tzibur. And that mentality, look, we have colleagues who say, you know, my job is I teach, I preach, I counsel, I do my life cycle events, I give my Pasha, my Blot Shir, I show up at Shachar's Men Chamarv, I do the Shiva Minion, and that's it. And then there are other models, and as I said, you and I share this, and I know we're trying to bring this in, in the RCA to provide the opportunities for people to learn what is the skill set of the Rav who's also a CEO? How do, you, how do you expand 
How do you leave your comfort zone, expand the possibility, express the ambition? How do you build community? How do you talk about things like branding and marketing? How do you talk about things like creativity and programming, membership, draw, retention, all kinds of things that are not normally part of the language of shul life, but bring them into shul life because our product is the most sacred product there is. It's Torah. It's being Marbek Fod Shemaim. That's the, the holiest mandate that we have. So he was really early on in doing that, and we stand on his shoulders in the mentality of being a Rav who's uncompromising, right? It's not that we're spending all of our time reading business books and never opening a Gemara or giving a Shear, but it's that we're saying, how can the Shear I give reach the most amount of people by expanding my thinking instead of only having my head down in the classic uh, sense of a Rav? So you're, you're definitely 100% correct. He recognized, and I think the key is that he recognized that every aspect of the community, every aspect of building the community is important to the way you want to shape the community, even the way he built the buildings. Even if you look at the front steps of the JEC to this day, if you go to the MLR Shul and you see the way the steps are built and the design, which is, is, is deliberate, replicating the Migdash, everything was done. He recognized that every aspect of every facet has to be done in a certain manner to get the result that you want. And I do have to say, and, and uh, my uncle should have many, many good years. They were a wonderful team together. And they complimented each other in their skill set. But I remember different stories of the things he did and the, and the incredible activities he engaged in. He just recognized that every component mattered to mm. transmit his message. And that really was the underpinning. You mentioned the idea. Let's really segue into another point. Since you talked about his spreading of Torah, I want to go to his uh, Dafa Shavua. And the Dafa Shavua, which was groundbreaking then, the idea that you were going to use technology. And think about it. Look at us right now. Look where we are right now. Look how many people are going to be watching this broadcast. And this broadcast will be on YouTube for generations. And my grandfather was far before his time with recognizing that there was a need to spread Torah to the masses. And it was controversial. It's so incredible. The thought that teaching Torah in public was controversial. He had to write chuvas to justify it. He had to get chuvas from other gedolim of his time to justify his activities because the shir he was giving in Yiddish, in Yiddish, right. mind you, may be listened to by non-Jews. Who knows who's going to listen? And it was a controversial act, but he was way before his time. And the concept, just a couple of points about the Zafah Shavua. Two things. One, the realization of how vast his reach was, how vast. At one point, the estimation was, because they were monitoring all broadcasts because of the communist activities in the 1950s, they estimated he had a quarter of a million listeners. It's incredible. And the other thing was his ability to use that platform to do so much more. When I was giving, in, uh, when I had the privilege of serving the Rav and Elizabeth, and I gave the Shabbos afternoon Gemara Shir, the Blot Shir, which my grandfather had given before me. So I was stepping into quite very large shoes. So I remember one week I gave a, a shear on whatever it was, whatever daf we were up to, and Mr. Alan Moskowitz came to me and said, you know, I want to share with you something after Shabbos. And he came to my apartment and he gave me a tape of daf Shavua of my grandfather doing the same sugya. And I didn't need to be humbled because I knew I wasn't my grandfather, but that was an incredible experience. My grandfather not only had the capacity to weave in all the mefarshim seamlessly into the Gemara because he knew it so well, but more profoundly, he was able to have talk about the events of the day. He was able to do that, and it flowed. It right. emanated from the Gemara. It emanated from the Torah perspective, from the Ashkaf, in which he was steeped, and he was able to do that. And I think to myself, what my grandfather would have done with today's technology, I can't believe what he would have done. But that was pioneering. It was novel, it was daring, and Akadosh Baruch Hu blessed it. No question, no question. But as you said, it was rooted in the fact that he was a genuine and authentic Talmud Chacham. Nobody could question his credentials. And while we think of him as the builder, the great founder of the Elizabeth or the, the greater or growth of Elizabeth community, it all comes back to his being a genuine Talmud Chacham. And we have, he has his tshuvas, it's far, we, have, we have real Torah that he produced and that he taught. And, and your uncle, as you mentioned, who should be well, um, I, I believe I saw someone uh, posted that he said at uh, Rabbi Taitz's Levaya that nobody knows the quality of Torah, but quantity of Torah, it's hard to imagine anyone taught or reached the amount of people that Rabbi Taitz reached because he embraced the medium and technology of his time. Had he remained only in his shul, closed down, maybe produced a flyer and said, come to my blotch here. So who knows in those days and even today? So there'd be a dozen people, a hundred people, how many would attend? But a quarter of a million weekly, the number is staggering. So in the 20th century, maybe one can say for much longer than that, 
who has reached that many people to be able to have that impact? You know, it, you would have said then, nobody ever used this word, you would have said, Rabbi Taitz has gone viral. His sheer, his, his, his uh, dafa shavua has gone viral. Had they used that word back then, they would, have, they would have said it. But absolutely, how pioneering and how, again, the word comes back to, to courage, to have the confidence that you're steeped in tradition and in Torah, to have the confidence that you're a Bar Hachi, that you're a Talmud Chacham, and therefore to not worry about the criticism that will come, and the confidence and courage to embrace the modern mediums to be able to use those platforms to teach. And as you said, January 17th, 1953, first broadcast of the Daf HaShavua, WEVD radio, pioneer, innovator, it's, it's mind-boggling. And, and as you said, what's, what's particularly, you know, we're, I could tell you exactly right now how many people are listening. I'm operating this in the back end, and I could tell you, and, and we're both humbled by how many people are tuning in, uh, and we appreciate on your, on your Sunday morning you're joining us. He had no idea. He started this on a whim. He had this idea and, uh, and courageously began it. And then letters and postcards came pouring in. And Sfarim stores said whatever Masechta he was teaching, they sold out of that Masechta. And that's how he knew. And like you said, there was opposition. Sometimes the best way as a Rav to know that you're doing something right is that it's not embraced by 100% of the people. Sometimes when there's pushback, it's evidence that you're doing something right. And he got support. Rav Moshe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rav Eliezer Silver, the Sri Deish, and, uh, and the big siyumim that he held, that uh, thousands of people attended, and so strategic, so brilliant, to invite his colleagues and his, and his friends and the gedolim of the time to come speak at those siyumim, which would then implicitly offer their endorsement to what he was doing, Rav Moshe and the Panovich Rav and Rav Aaron Cutler and others uh, at different times who happened to be here, and to spread out. Right? He became syndicated, again, a word maybe they didn't use in those days. Boston, Chicago, Detroit, LA, Miami, Montreal, Philadelphia, and other places, it really is mind-boggling. So, you know, just relaying it as, as we're meant to do in this, uh, in this conversation this morning, relaying it to me, um, it, I, I wasn't the earliest and maybe not even considered early, but earlier on embracing social media than other Rabbanim. I mean, I and I didn't and I don't use social media to show anyone the dessert that I had or what my children are up to or my vacation or anything like that. I never have and Mir Tashem, I never will use it for that. But I saw early on, Ba'asher Hashem, again, along the same theme of Rabbi Taitz taught us, is that you can reach people where they are, where they're at. And that's where a segment of our community, a demographic, that's where they are. Right now, for the last nine months, that's where we all are. So those who were ready early on were ready for this. And those who weren't had to first learn that tool, and some still haven't adjusted to it, and how much Talmud Torah is lost out because of it. So when I first started posting articles or giving shiurim and using social media to do it, I got pushback, I got criticism. What does it say about a Rav and you're endorsing these places that are not places that uh, B'nai Torah should participate? And, uh, and now I feel vindicated. Now I laugh because major rabbinic organizations, and I'm not talking about the RCA, and major rabbinic personalities whose beards are much longer than mine are giving the shiurim on these same social media platforms, embracing them, using them, utilizing them, and asking, by the way, how do I do it? How can I reach more people? How can I have it spread farther? So this point about Rabbi Taitz's legacy particularly is poignant for me um, because it gives it gives chizuk, it gives courage. A person, I'm, I'm obviously no Rabbi Taitz in, in in a million ways, you have to have Rebbeim that you could turn to to ask, are you doing the right thing? But once you have the courage of your convictions and once you know that it's purely halachically permissible to not worry about what the naysayers and the haters, again, a modern term that he had haters back in his day, what they will say, but but the, the proof is in the pudding, right? And the result is the ultimate vindication. And a quarter of a million listeners a week, just, just combine the numbers, Combine the numbers, right? If he would do a charity campaign today on those numbers and be able to show on the screen, right? Just multiply a quarter of a million a week by 52 weeks and say, yeah, my, my, my blachir, my dafa shavua, I teach several million people a year. Don't you think it's worthwhile to contribute to? So the numbers are staggering and mind-boggling, and it's not just something to admire as something about the past, but we should embrace it as something that informs our present to realize that we have the privilege with our rabbinic voices to not only reach the people in our community, the people who audibly our voice literally enters their ear, but using technology we could reach so much more. And that's not an expression or reflection of ego or arrogance, but rather it's a sense of responsibility. And I think you've hit that very beautifully, a perfectly segue into my next uh, area of, of next topic of conversation. But again, just to highlight, he really we, what we're doing now, we're standing on his shoulders and we're asking to do it really very, very well. A lot of us aspire to follow your lead, um, but all of us, 
it, it's it's following that model and never shying away, being courageous and recognizing that you can and must use the mediums of days. That same, you'll see the same strands keep coming back and forth. He talked about his courage and his willing to be an activist. And I think there, one of the areas that he created, felt the most pride in was his activities on behalf of the mm -hmm. Jews of the Soviet Union. Making more than 20, 20 trips, I believe 25 trips, behind the Iron Curtain at a time when no one could get there. And the realization that we do have a responsibility. We do have a responsibility to take care of everyone else. We can't just be worried about ourselves. At a time when it seemed like it was impossible, like it was a Don Quixote task to go and try to help and save Russian Jewry. And it's true. Later on, we can mention the fact that all the various movements that happened that were so instrumental and really fighting hard for Russian Jewry. My grandfather was there behind the scenes before any of those things happened. And those trips, which were harrowing trips, they were not easy trips. Uh, the, the really the the level of oppression and the level of watching. I remember he, they, they were watched all the time. The phone calls were monitored. There was one individual who who connected himself to my grandfather. He claimed to be a rav, and he said he was going to go around with my grandfather. He'll help him out. And they, my grandfather still had he and my grandmother Lasham had relatives still in Europe. And one of the relatives came over to my grandfather, took him inside, and said. And I'll say it in Yiddish and then translate. Erz a Rebbe, Erz a Rav, Azoy Ich bin a Rebbetzin. That person is a rabbi, like I'm a Rebbetzin. He's the KGB agent that's mm. really following you. And it didn't matter. My grandfather was undeterred. And, and no matter if people liked his approach, didn't like his approach, he knew. And I mentioned, uh, I remember very, very vividly a story. Uh, Dave Sky, many of the people in the community knew him well, Dave Sky, Shalom who ran Sky Hebrew Bookstore for all these years, used to put together the sets of Dalad Minif, the little of them in his Shrogan that were sent before Yantif. And my grandfather would send, he had the connections, he'd get them the Dalad Minim, he'd get them the Sidurim, he'd get them the Matzos. And Dave was sitting Shiva, and it was the time to prepare the Dalad Minim. And my grandfather Paskin, again, that courage, that conviction, that after he would sit Shiva during the day, he could go back to the store at night and put together those Dalad Minim. And it was unheard of. And people thought it was a lost cause, but it didn't matter. It was the right thing to do, and he didn't shy away for a second to do it. It it, it really is extraordinary because again, you have rabbanim who excel as tamidei chachamim and poskim and rashi yeshiva, and you have rabbanim in pastoral care, and you have rabbanim in and and he just combined it all. So this this component, first of all, it makes all of us feel so grossly inadequate and, and inferior. It's really it's really extraordinary, all combined in one person. So yeah, that sense of activism, and again. You talk about revisiting these same themes. So someone could say, look, I myself am an immigrant. I came here. I'm doing enough. I'm building community. I'm founding institutions. I'm teaching Torah. I'm innovating using technological platforms. Like, Shine, it's enough. I'm doing enough. But it wasn't just that he went back to Russia the amount of times that he went back. It was that he created this entity, Mifal Hatzalas Yahadus Russia, and that he printed these cal calendars and almanacs and booklets and svarim, and he created a religious manual and a sitter for Americans, and, and I've seen a copy of that sitter. The title page of the sitter that he created, that he printed and that he brought back, also says so much about him. The title page says, Sitter Kol Yisrael Chaverim. Barichas Harav Pinchas Mordechai Taitz Av Beisden Ramda Elizabeth New Jersey. Right, the name of the sitter is Kol Yisrael Chaverim. The very name of the sitter is All Jews have a responsibility to one another. And so he risked his life. He went back. He went back early on. He went back when it wasn't easy. He went back when Stalin died and his hotel room, as you said, was bugged and people were following him and it was very difficult. And he developed these relationships with the Fusniks. Here, here's the amazing part. He didn't just end that he printed materials and smuggled them in and risked his life and went back to a place where he put his own life in danger. Then when people immigrated and he was able to get refused next year, he helped them find apartments and jobs and school and medical care and so, so much more. So it really, really is amazing because at each step of the way, you say it's not a Rav who rested on his laurels. It's not a Rav who said what I'm doing is enough. It's what more can I be doing? What's the next big step? What's the next big thing? When I, um, and again, I know I'm telling you what you know, but I'm sharing for the, the sake of our audience who's listening, that's sense of activism goes back way before Elizabeth, way before he ever came to America in, in uh, your mother's amazing book. She recalls all this, the story and, and the history, but going back, he worked with the Friedrich Rebbe, the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, to free a, a Jew, a member of the Latvian parliament who had been imprisoned, and, and Zev Jabotinsky understood the future activism in this young, budding Talmud Chacham and tried to recruit him to be a spokesperson for Zionism, which of course he, he didn't accept, but the very fact that 
Jabotinsky saw that potential in him, that activism means that it was evident even at a, at a young age. So I think this also has to inform our rabbinate today, and our activism may be different. And we don't have a Soviet Jewry movement, and, and we're blessed that we don't have the Soviet Jewry movement in the sense that there aren't uh, millions of Jews living behind the Iron Curtain anymore. But it's also a challenge to our generation because I remember as, as a young boy going to those rallies on Sunday. Now, it happens to be your grandfather was against the rallies, which is also another reflection of the courage of his conviction, right? He, he put it, he, he was activist, he went. He was entitled to an opinion. It wasn't that he sat back and said, don't do that, right? He said, here's what we're doing instead. Maybe because he was there and he saw the conditions, he thought they would be worsened if we were doing the rallies and so on. He was against the rallies, and it's a fascinating debate, the history of the, the Soviet Jewry movement, of which both sides deservedly take some credit because it probably was a combination of it all. He was against the rallies. But I remember as a child going to those rallies, and we had a cause. We thought there was something worth fighting for. And what is the cause of today? And whether it's in Cleveland or Boca Tone, what can we get young people to wake up to? Right? Fighting coronavirus is not a cause. Unfortunately, the, the, the virus you know, won't respond to, to, to rallies. So, so what's the cause that we can get people excited and fired up about um, the way Soviet Jewry was that he dedicated himself to? And there are other causes that I think building on his model, we as Rabbanim have to be activists in whether it's the people who are victims of abuse, or whether it's agunas, or whether it's people who are struggling with infertility, or whether it's people struggling with poverty, or whether it's drug, whatever other areas that is Rabbanim, we can't put our head in the sand and say, I teach Torah, I give my shir, life cycle events, I show up to Mincha. We have to follow his model of also looking at our day, what are the causes for which we need to be activists, take risks, show courage, and recruit others to be involved as well. Excellent point, an excellent, excellent point. You mentioned the fact that this starts in his youth, so I want to highlight both his youth and his age, and you can pick up whichever one of the two points you'd like to go on from there. Um, it is well known. Uh, my mother does relate it in her, her book, but I remember hearing the story from him when he came home once from Yeshiva from Slobodka, and he had found that the local cheder had taken a different approach than he had thought was appropriate, and he stayed home for a few months and created his own Yeshiva. He created the yeshiva. He was a young man. He couldn't have been more than in his teens, but he thought it was important. And he created the school called Yavna, Yavna V'chachamah. It was originally a deliberate point. And that sense that you have to rise to the occasion. And all of us have to find what the occasion is in our lifetimes, in our, and not even in our lifetimes, that can change in our lifetimes, the different periods. But he rose to the occasion, and he created this school. And in the same way, and I'm giving you a lot of material, Ephraim, to, to go from, with Ephraim, but he, when he came to Elizabeth, and he felt there was a need for a day school. And again, we take for granted, Baruch Hashem, how many day schools are there in, in, all across our country? But that wasn't the case. There were no right. day schools. Right. And my late great-grandfather had tried and wasn't able to be successful. And he and uh, they complained to my late great-grandfather of Prell that he was starting the school for his daughters. And he said, you're right. My daughters are also Jewish children. They also deserve an education. My grandfather said, he's going to see it through. And that's when, of course, he hired your late grandmother. But that was novel and creating a day school when it wasn't popular, and, cre mm. and, and building it, and building the, the boys' high school, and a girls' high school, or again, outside of New York, how many were there? It's the same model. You rise to the occasion. Chinuch is paramount. One of my favorite, I apologize, I'll be very rabbinic. One of my favorite divrei Torah. Uh, there are so many beautiful divrei Torah that my late grandfather said, but one that always struck with me, and I've used many, many times, it's a discussion coming up in next week's Parsha. Next week's Parsha, there's time for Am Yisrael to go down. The Shvatim, the family, is going down to Egypt, and Yehuda is sent early to Goshen. Why is he sent to Goshen earlier? So Rashi says, to start a yeshiva, to start a base medrash. So the question is asked, but Yosef has just shown. Yosef has just shown his father that he retained. He was Yosef at Tzadik Yivit in Egypt. And on Ephraim, Menashe, Arkeruven, Veshimon. He was able to raise a beautiful family committed to the ideals of, the, of Yaakov Avinu. Why was there a need to start a school in Egypt, to start a day school, mm. so to speak? And my grandfather said, Yechide school can do that. But a community, coming full circle back, a community can't survive. Can't be. You need, that's the foundation. He always felt the JC was the foundation of the community. And that's that same sense of rising to the occasion. And just for a fullness, on the other end of his life, when he was much older, he had been a member of the Agudas Rabbanim for countless years, but he had felt the Agudas Rabbanim had changed direction, and he felt the need to rebuild. And he created a new rabbinic organization, the Mecca's Rabbanim, and he was already not a young man, a man in his 70s, and easily could have rested on his laurels. I've done my part for the American Jewish community. I've done my part right. of rabbinic leadership. Right. And I was there at the first meetings. I had the privilege of, his, of being with him. And he was 
forceful there to the end. And again, incredible balance. As a young man coming to Elizabeth, creating the JEC, and then later starting the Mecca's Rabbanim, never shying away. When, when the situation demanded his voice, it was there. Yeah, and, and in the case of the Agudas Arabanim, or the Merkas Arabanim, you know, that, that's actually a story, not Khalila of a failure of Rabbi Taitz, but when we look at his, his life, his legacy, and we think that everything he touched turned to gold, in a sense, with the, with the community that he built, it's not true. And it's important for us Rabbanim to know that too, to be humbled by that and to be realistic about it. It didn't fail to anything of his own. It failed because other people didn't step up. And as you said, it was the 80s. He was older, already older and at a point of life when most people were in retreat. And though he recruited others, he started it with Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky, and, and it, got the, um, it got the endorsement of Rav Shach and the Stipler and, and others, of Schneer Cutler, of Ruderman. But in the end of the day, nobody stepped up with him. Now, what I find fascinating about that is, um, at least again from, from my research, and you were there, so you can confirm this is true, what he was disappointed in, the Agudas HaRabbanim of the time, was that the tone had turned negative and hypercritical. It was no longer about positive and building, but it was really about negative and critical of others and what they were doing wrong. And he thought there needed to be established another group of Rabbanim who would not simply exist to criticize, condemn, and, and be negative about others, but as he had done his whole career, be positive and see the opportunities and the needs and to build. So even the whole story of what precipitated his disappointment with one group of Rabbanim and his desire to build another is so instructive about who he was and about who we should be. That sadly, too many people only identify themselves by what they're not. I'm not this to the right, I'm not this to the left, I'm not this over there, I'm not this behind me. And he felt that a person shouldn't identify by what they're not, but identify by what they are. Don't be hypercritical and don't be negative, but be positive and create in a positive way. And, and nobody else stepped up and nobody else took the mantle with him. And that's why, unfortunately, that is not part of his ongoing legacy. Not that it was a failure of his, but in the sense that it didn't, that it didn't continue. So I'll, I'll again ask you a question. When we study and we reflect and we think about Rabbi Taitz, are these traits and skills any Rav can learn? You know, some, some young Rav on him, because while I still consider myself a young Rav, uh, the color of my beard would indicate otherwise. So I sometimes get called by young Rav on him and they and they ask, okay, so Boca is the CEO model. Can we learn that skill set? Somebody who's more of an introvert or somebody who doesn't have that creativity or that vision more naturally or more innately. Can you learn it? Can you learn that skill set? Can somebody study Rabbi Taitz's life and say, I want to emulate it? Can, can a person learn that vision? Can they learn that courage? Can they learn that activism? Can they learn that innovation? Are these skills that people can learn? Or are Rabbanim just cut of different cloths? And some communities need and will get Rabbanim who are a little bit more limited, but maybe also more focused. And others will get Rabbanim who come from a different model. Do you think these are things that people can learn? I think it's an excellent question. I think like in most things, the answer is very nuanced. I think we turn to my grandfather's life and all the various attributes that we have highlighted, and there's definitely what to learn from. And I think sometimes we have to push ourselves. You made the reference earlier, push ourselves out of our comfort zone and perhaps realize that you can take on more. I don't think he started off thinking, okay, planned all these various activities they were going to do, he was going to engage. And as they came up, there was a need and he filled it. And he did it right. very well. Uh, so I think on the one hand, I think there's a lesson for younger Rabbanim. Look for the model. Look to the model of Rav Taif. Look to the model of Maizeda. And recognize there's so much more you can do. Don't sell yourself short. I think the other option is really also recognizing that if the need is there, then you have to build it in your rabbinate. And all of us recognize we have our limitations. And my grandfather also recognized that he needed to work with others. He needed to have partners. And the partners took on different forms in different contexts. And if we recognize that the areas where he was so forceful and so unique, uh, perhaps we can't emulate to the fullest, but if we realize that that's important, then we have to get it done some other way. And I think that's the dual duality of the lesson, pushing ourselves beyond, pushing ourselves to things that perhaps we recognize, okay, I haven't been comfortable, let's go back to technology. I haven't been comfortable up till now doing this, right. but I should embrace it more, little by little. And other areas, trying to get more adept and, a, and astute at some of these areas, but when I can't, but I know it's necessary. My grandfather showed it's necessary mm. to be successful. It's necessary to build community. Kla Yisrael needs it, so maybe I can't do all those parts, but I have to find others who can. 
Yeah, and, and I guess none of us can afford to leave out the part of Rav Taita's life where he sat and he learned, where he became a Tabu Chacham, where he was Meshamish Tamid Chachamim. Meaning, it would be terrible if a, you know, a 23-year-old assistant rabbi were to be hearing us have this conversation and then boldly tomorrow announce some new activist, you know, some new approach, founding some new thing, fighting some new fight. You need to be a Rabbi Taita. You need to establish yourself and your credentials. And the thing that he did, which is, which is very interesting, that is a repeating theme that comes up in, in this activism, and we can include the building of institutions, under activism is like you just said, Rabbi Blau. He 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 engaged partners and be it the builders of Elizabeth, who were the financial backers and partners who shared their wisdom, not only the resources, but be it also fellow gedolim and and colleagues that he had known from Slobodka and well beyond, who when he embraced innovation wanted to make sure as historically great Rabbanim always did, that it was something that other Rabbanim would sign on to as well. And I think in that way, it's a it's a great precedent to learn from too. I, I fully agree. I, I was so privileged. It was actually interesting growing up as his grandson everywhere we went. So when I was a little boy in seventh grade in JEC or eighth grade, and we went for a Jeb Shabbaton to Brooklyn, they took us around to various Gedolim, and they would point out, here are the kids from Elizabeth, and this is Rabbi Taita's grandson, because he knew them all, and he was close mm. to them all. And while uh, I, some say people ask me, did you feel any pressure to go into the rabbinate? 22 straight generations said, no pressure. It was very natural. It was not a big deal at all. Um, but this was his, these were his partners. These were his Yedidim. These were his Chavei. And you mentioned the builders who he really valued so much for their support and their wisdom. And I want to take even a step further. He felt the community was his partners. When he used to talk about well, saving Russian Jewry, he would always turn to the community and say, we're saving Russian Jewry. And it didn't matter if we all knew. All of us in the room knew that he was doing 99% of the work. He made right. the community feel, this is mm. what we're doing. He took pride. He loved the community. He loved the Kehila, and he wanted them to feel partners in all his endeavors. So we're building, we're building the community. We're building the JEC. We're spreading Torah through Dafa Shavua. We're saving Russian Jewry. And all of that with that same mindset. And that is such a powerful idea that we have to express to our own communities as Rabbanim. The sense that whatever projects we're engaged in, it is a community project. They should feel that pride in what their Rav is doing, but deeper than the pride, the sense of partnership with their Rav, that this is something we as a community are taking on and we as a community are accomplishing. That is such a great point. Um, we, we have several uh, people who live in Boca who came from Elizabeth. And I don't think there's a community in America where people are more proud to have come from than Elizabeth. And in fact, you know, Rabbi Josh Brody, my dear friend who grew up in Elizabeth, you know, when, when he first came here and he didn't go to YU, he went to, he went to Nei Yisrael. So whenever someone would quote the Rav for a long time, he thought they were talking about Rabbi Tights. Because if you grew up in Elizabeth, the Rav was Rabbi Tights, not Rabbi Soloveitchik. He was the Rav. And everybody eats bananas as karpas. And everybody does this. And everybody does whatever the Minhage Elizabeth are. That's the world. And so, yeah, he was able to engender not just a community or a city that deferred or bowed to him, but that took pride themselves in all that they accomplished as a group. And the products of Elizabeth, Adayom until this very day, are so proud to come from Elizabeth and so proud to talk about the Rav or their memories of the Rav or their connection to the Rav and so on. I just walked a young woman out of Shiva this morning before we began, whose, uh, whose mother was in Elizabeth, taught in the JEC, and her reflections and memories about, about Rabbi Ta'ah, she's walking out of Shiva, is, you know, wanted to make sure before we did this program that she'd be able to share. And, and on our podcast a few months ago, we had Mark Wilf on, who was sharing his memories growing up in Elizabeth. You know, today, an owner of an NFL team and, and a son of one of the builders, but his, the impact that Rabbi Tights had on, on his life and his vision and his Jewish communal work. And, and I'll ask you this in an apolitical way, because this is an apolitical conversation, but would your grandfather ever have believed that one of the builders, his good friend's grandson, would be in the White House advising, shaping Midi's policy and bringing peace between Israel and its neighbors. Um, would he ever believe that one of the builders with whom he built Elizabeth would have such not only access, would be essentially a resident of, of that, of that uh, place and have that, and have that power? And I'll ask you this, if Rabbi Tights were alive over the last four years, what would he have been whispering into Jared Kushner's ear would be the most important things for him to be working for and fighting for on behalf of the Jewish people? Because there's no doubt that he would not have been looking for an invitation to the Hanukkah party. That would not have interested him. He'd be looking for how can that unusual place of, of power be used to advance the needs of the Jewish people? What would he be telling him? So that's a question, a good hypothetical question that no one can give the right answer to because my grandfather would have seen the needs of the present and the needs of the future. 
and he would have tried to find a way to do both. And he was, you mentioned he's a political, he really was always concerned what was best for the Jewish people, for Am Yisrael, wherever they were. And I remember the time when he hosted Jimmy Carter all those years back. And he really, and, and, his, and the great and the admiration of the various governors, both Republicans and Democrat governors, had for my grandfather, who had total admiration for him. And he had their ear because they knew he had that distinct voice and that integrity and that confidence and the real concern for Am Yisrael. So I think he, I don't think he would have been so surprised. I think he would have been proud, but I think more deeply than that, I think he would have used, looked at what are the issues that we have to deal with today and try to look 20 years ahead, be planning always for the future. That really was part of his greatness. That was part of his mm. uniqueness. Rev. Ephraim, we're almost at an hour. So I'd like to give you a chance to have any of your last thoughts, and then I'll wrap up as well. I'll take the privilege, the little privilege of being the grandson and, and having the last word, if you don't mind. But Rebecca, your yeah. last thoughts. And again, I thank you for this opportunity, to, it, to our, our continuing friendship and our continuing both standing on my grandfather's shoulders. And from your last words, and then I'll conclude. Well, thank you, and, and thank Rabbi Shapiro, and thank you to the JEC for this. Um, it really is a, a privilege of, of all the things I think I've sent to my parents because I wanted to give them nachas when I forwarded them this flyer. And I said, look, I'm speaking for Elizabeth. What would my Bubby and Zeta say? What would, it, what would they have to say with such memories of sitting in the pews in, in the JEC and, and listening to your grandfather and, and feeling, by extension, a sense of pride in Elizabeth and as I alluded to earlier, whenever I meet anybody connected to Elizabeth, being able to ask them, you know, did, did my grandmother teach them? So I share in that pride. Um, you know, so look, again, I was very young, and my memories of Rabbi Taitz are really of, of, of watching him from afar, and of course of the relationship that he shared with the family. And it's only when I matured and I've become a, a rabbi myself do I study his legacy to draw from it. And it's not a platitude because I was invited to this program that I'm saying this. It's Emmis, it's 100% true that whether implicitly or explicitly, so much of what he did in Elizabeth is what we're trying to emulate today here in Boca. And, and all of those notions of reaching people where they are and uh, extending beyond our comfort zone and in engaging in the, the innovative opportunities of the present to be able to have the impact go as far as it can. And, and as you so importantly just recent, just raised, the notion of the we, not the I, that the brand is more important than the person, that the community you're trying to create is more important than any individual, any individual in it. So I continue to be inspired by his legacy, as do as do so many other people. And you know, there's some comments that have been coming in as we're as we're teaching. And 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 one person, you know, I know from growing up, Aaron Fishman writes, I remember of tights being very approachable, even to a younger kid who may have a shyla. That even as great as he was and all that he accomplished, he wasn't distant. He wasn't apart. Um, but younger kids also could approach him and can relate to him and can connect him, and he dedicated himself to being there. So he really is, he set the bar very, very high for, high for us to try to combine all of those skill sets and to try to achieve all of those accomplishments and to try to be available to all of those demographics and to reach people in all of those in all of those different ways. And I can only hope and pray that the people who grow up and graduate our communities will feel that same sense of pride, that same sense of mission, that same set of values, having very have growing up with clarity of who we are and what we stand for, that they will be proud to have been a part of it, and that his legacy on this 25th year site will continue to inspire us today and for many, many years to come. Rev. Epin, that's such a beautiful way to close, and I'm not sure if I have more to add, but perhaps on a personal note, really just want to end. I think Clay Israel misses his voice. I think he had the opportunity he would speak up at so many times in a way that some, sometimes we're not always comfortable doing. I think the community misses his leadership, and I have to say on a personal note, I miss his love. He was so, we were very, very close. I was very, very fortunate to be with him so often. I loved how every time I would come home from yeshiva, he would always ask, how I was doing, and he wanted to know if I was growing. He always wanted to see me aspire. He wanted me to aspire to the same level of greatness. I think all of us, all of us, uh, have learned so much for him. We're his legacy. And he's Baruch. May his memory be a blessing, and may he continue to inspire all of us for many, many years to come. I thank you all for this pleasure, being the opportunity to share this memories and pay tribute to my late grandfather. And I look forward to doing wonderful things together again in the future. Thank blah, you. Blah, before, you before you close, I just don't want to be remiss. So I'm going to ask you to say one sentence because uh, this is so important, especially in our time, to acknowledge. As we're reflecting on his Yeritzite, can you spend one moment in closing again um, by reflecting on your grandmother, his Rebetzin, and her role as a partner with him in doing, in doing everything that we've been talking about for the last hour? 
So that's really wonderful, Rav Ephraim. Thank you. It's a beautiful thing to do. They were partners. We talked about all the partnerships that he had had. And we talked about the partnerships with other Rabban. And we talked about the partnerships with the builders, with the community, with the we. But the strongest we in my grandfather's life was my grandmother. The two of them were a regal couple. They really were. They stood with dignity. They were partners in everything they did. You mentioned the fact that she helped him with his speeches. But she was helpful in everything. And they were both two wonderful, powerful personalities, both of them with tremendous dedication to their roots, to their own Misora. And even till I remember as a child, we would sing Zmiros, we'd sing the same Zemmer, half like my grandfather's niggin, half like my bubby's niggin, because both of them were fiercely loyal. And, and her loyalty to Elizabeth was perhaps even greater than his, because after all, this was her father's and her mother's place. And they were partners. Everything my grandfather did, he was around saving the world, changing the world. Well, you can't do that if you don't have a partner rooting you. And my grandmother rooted my grandfather. And while he was doing everything else, particularly when it came to Elizabeth, she made sure that as much as he saved the world and went to Russia, which he, she went with him all those times, she went with him on those trips, as much as she supported every one of his endeavors, she was his partner in everything. And at the last degree, of course, in that same vein, uh, she, she kept him focused on Elizabeth, which was so dear to her heart. And I think that too, I think of Ephraim, maybe that's the most appropriate note to end on. The partnership that my grandparents had together, it's my grandfather's yard site, but they together did everything. And both of us are privileged as well to have partners, to have Rebbitons, to have wives who are our partners in all that we do, because we can't accomplish anything without those partnerships. And I think that is the most appropriate way to end in a beautiful tribute to both my grandparents. Thank you for that note. That's all.